Transformers came into our lives just a couple of years ago, but they have been taking the NLP area by storm. Libraries like Hugging Face has made it very easy for everyone to use Transformers, or implementations like BERT or GPT-3 is the reason that everyone is talking about them. But what are they and how do they work? So in this video, we will look closely into Transformers and understand their working principles. This video is part of the Deep Learning Explained series by Assembly AI, which is a company that is making a state-of-the-art speech-to-text API. If you want to use Assembly AI for free, get your free API token using the link in the description. Before Transformers were this common, we were using RNNs to deal with text data, or any sequence data really. But the problem with RNNs is that when you give it a very long sentence, it tends to forget the beginning of the sentence when it comes to the end of the sentence. And because they rely on recurrence, well, it's in the name, recurrent neural networks, they cannot be parallelized. Then we start using LSTMs. LSTMs are a little bit more sophisticated. They tend to remember information for a little bit longer of a time, but they take very long to train. Well, then we have transformers. Transformers only rely on attention mechanisms to remember things. They do not have any recurrence at all. And thanks to this, they are faster because we can parallelize them. We can tra train them in a parallel way. Okay, but what is this attention? We can definitely make another video to talk about that. And if you're interested in that, definitely comment and let me know. But generally, attention is the ability of a model to pay attention to the important part of a sentence or an image or any kind of input, really. So if it's a sentence, this is what it would look like. So let's say we have a English sentence and the sentence is, the agreement on the European economic area was signed in August 1992. And the other side is the French translation of that, but I do not know the first thing about French, so I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. <laughs> but as you can see in this chart, what we see is that the lighter the color of the square, the more attention our model is paying to the word in that line or in that row or column. And as you can see, it does not always go in a diagonal way. When it is translating European economic area, because the word order is reversed in French, it is paying attention in a reversed way. If this was an image, and let's say we are looking for dogs in images, and we are trying to um, classify different breeds of dogs, then you can see what your model is paying attention to. Is it the noses of the dogs? Is it the ears of the dogs? What exactly in an image is the model paying attention to, to be able to understand the difference between dog breeds? All right, now that we briefly looked at what attention is, let's look into how the transformer networks learn and how what their architecture is. So this is what a transformer network more or less looks like. But we will go and start from the higher levels and then start breaking down everything and understand how they work together. So the basic thing on a very high level, what transformers have is an encoder and a decoder part. But actually what they have is six encoders and six decoders. But basically the right left hand side is the encoders and the right hand side is the decoders. Each encoder has one self-attention layer that is paying attention to the sentence itself, and one feed-forward forward neural network layer. And every decoder has two self-attention layers and one feed-forward neural network layer. The parallelization comes from how we feed the data into this network. We feed all the words of the sentence at the same time to our network specifically the encoder. Inside the first step, which is the self-attention sublayer, all the words of the sentence is compared to all the other words in the sentence. So there is some communication between the words. Whereas in the next step, in the feed-forward neural network, they are passed through a feed-forward neural network separately. So they do not have any information exchange. But the feed-forward neural networks that they are passed through are the same inside the same layer. But as we said, there are six encoders. And each, each, in each of these six encoders, the neural networks are different. Okay, so this has been kind of the middle part of the network. We also have the inputs and the outputs. So all the inputs that go in either the encoder or the decoder, the raw inputs, are embedded. What are embeddings? Well, that's a little bit of a longer topic for this video. But again, if you like us to make a video on this, leave a comment. Uh, but what you need to know for now is that embeddings are a way to represent these words in a n-length vector. In this specific transformer architecture, they are using 512 
length vectors. And that's basically what they use in the original paper. But this is a hyperparameter that you can change. And on top of these word embeddings, we are adding positional encodings. So if you remember, we said transformers do not have any recurrence. So the model has no way of understanding which word comes first and the other one comes second or which word comes where in the sentence. So by adding a positional encoding, you are letting or you are adding some information or injecting some information with each word that tells the model where this word in the sentence comes in. And lastly, for the output, as you can see, we have a linear layer and a softmax layer at the end of the decoders. So the output of the decoders can be transformed into something that we can understand. And basically what they turn into is a vector that has the length of the amount of words that we have in our vocabulary. And each of these cells tells us how likely it is that this word in this cell is going to be the next word in our sequence. And those are the main components, but there are two little things that make transforms a little bit better. One of them is the normalization layers. So if you realize in between the sublayers, that is the uh, self-attention layers and the feedforward neural networks, we have some add and normalize layers. And what they do is to normalize the output that comes from the sublayer. The normalization techniques that is used there is called layer normalization. And that is basically an improvement over batch normalization. And if you don't know what batch normalization is, we already made a video about that. I will link it somewhere here and you can go watch that to understand a little bit better what batch normalization or layer normalization is. And the second little detail is the skip states. So if you look at the original architecture image, we see that there are some arrows that are going around some of the sublayers. Well, actually all of the sublayers. So some of the information that does not go into uh, either the self-attention layer, sublayers or the feed for old neural networks are sent directly to the normalization layer. This kind of helps the model not forget things and it helps the model to forward information that is important to further in the network. Inside these normalization layers, what we do is add the information that went through the sublayer and also just skip the sublayer and then normalize them together. And that's all there is to the architecture of transformers. And if you look into it, actually most of the things that are inside this architecture are things that we've known from before. Things have been around for a long time. For example, linear transformations, softmax layers, or word embeddings, for example, or the feedforward neural networks. But there are two really novel ideas inside the original transformer paper that really made the difference for transformers. And those were positional encodings and multi-headed attention. So let's take a closer look at how they work. Let's start with multi-headed attention layers. So if you look at the original architecture, you see that there are two different types of multi-headed attention layers. One of them is just multi-headed attention and the other one is masked multi-headed attention. Well, it actually does the same thing no matter if it's called masked or not, if it's in an encoder and a decoder. And the only difference is in a normal multi-headed attention layer, all the words are compared with all the other words that are inputted, that are in a sentence, but that will make more sense to you in a second, what I mean by comparing. And for masked multi-headed attention layers, only the words that are coming before a word are compared to that word in the sentence. In the attention layer, something called the scaled dot product attention is used, and then it is multiplied and is done multiple times to create that multi-headed effect. And of course, everything is done in matrices to make things faster. But I will show you how attention is calculated using just the vectors of words. What do we have in the beginning are embeddings of words. If you remember, we embedded the words into a vector and also we added positional encodings. And then this is fed to the first encoder and of course at first is fed to the multi-headed attention sublayer of the first encoder. So in there, what is done first is to multiply these embedding vectors with some matrices. These matrices are called Curie, key and value matrices. And these are values that are initialized randomly and are trained during the training process to be learned, kind of like the weights and biases we have in neural networks. As a result of this multiplication, we get the query, key and value vector for each word. And from this point on, we are going to use these vectors to keep going with the calculation. The first thing that we want to do is to calculate a score for each word against 
all the other words in the sentence. What we do for this is we dot, take the dot product of the query vector of each word against the key vector of all the other words. So if you want to get the score of the first word on the first word, what we do is we get the dot product of the query vector of word one with the key vector of word one. If we want to get the score of the first word against the second word, we might get the dot product of the query vector of the first word with the key vector of the second word. So when we get the dot product of all the key vectors of all the other words compared with or combined with the query vector of the first word, we have the score of the first word against all the other words. So they all belong, all of these scores belong to the first word. If you want to get the scores for the second word, we're going to have to multiply its query vector with all the other words key vectors. And this is what it's done and it's all done in parallel. So that's why we do not have any recurrence or we don't have to wait for other words to be done before starting to process the words further in the sentence. We can do these calculations for all the words at the same time. Once we have all the scores of all the words against all the other words, what we're going to do is to divide them by eight. So that might sound like a very random number for you, but it's basically the square root of 64, which is again, sound like a very random number that comes out of nowhere. But actually 64 is the square root of the length of the query key and value vectors. And that's why the authors of the original Transformers paper are using that number. After we divide everything by eight, we pass all these values through a softmax layer. We do this to normalize all these values and the score values of one word against all the other words are now going to sum up to one. The resulting number serves kind of like a weight. From this point on, what we're going to do is to multiply all the value vectors of all the words with this weight. And finally, you sum up all the weighted value vectors of all the words based on this one word that we were doing the calculations for and create the output of the self-attention layer for this one word. And then you have to do all of these calculations for all the other words. Well, this is done simultaneously, but at the end you have the output of the attention layer. As I mentioned, multi-headed attention does this eight times. So effectively it is training eight different query, key, and value matrices, not the vectors for the words, but the matrices that we multiply the um, input embeddings with. This way, the model is able to pay attention to not one other word, but many other words in the sentence. So in the model, they're using the number eight, but you can basically change it if you like to. And let's look at this example again that we gave at the beginning of this video. As you can see, there are some of the um, cells that are really bright, but at the same time, we also have some cells that are just kind of gray. And that means that our model was also paying attention to those other words other than the primary word that they're paying attention to a little bit. And this multi-headed attention thing is also one of the reasons why transformers are so seamlessly able to deal with sentences of different length. One thing you might catch here is that if we do the same thing eight times, what we're going to have is eight different resulting matrices, right? And inside these matrices, one line is going to correspond to one word, but we're going to have eight of them. So how are we going to deal with this? Well, what they do in the paper or what they propose to do is basically concatenate them all together and then multiply them with yet another weight mat matrix that is going to produce a matrix that is going to look like only one output of the attention layer. This weight matrix is of course yet another thing to train inside the transformers on top of the key value and query matrices that we multiply all of the word embeddings with. Next is positional encoding. So as I mentioned before, positional encodings is a way to inject or add information to the word embeddings that we've created before to show where in a sentence a word is. So basically the location information of a word. You can either use learned positional encodings or fixed positional encodings, but in the paper, in the original paper, they suggest or they recommend that we use fixed positional encodings because they have the advantage of being able to handle lengths of sentences that we haven't seen in the training set. You might say, why do we need any sophisticated 
solution for this anyways. Why can't we just assign a number to the word specifying where in the sentence this word is? So that wouldn't really work because let's say if you assign a number that goes from zero to one, what's going to happen is that you're not going to really understand how many words are in that sentence just by looking at this one word. And this value will not be consistent in between examples. Another solution could be to assign integers to words, of course, starting from one or zero to however long the sentence is. But the problem with that one is that those numbers can get very high, right? If you have a very long sentence, that could get out of control. And on top of that, there could be sentences with specific lengths that you do not have in the training data. And that could cause some problems in terms of generalization. So what they did as a solution to this positional problem in the original Transformers paper was to use sine and cosine functions in different frequencies. But of course, I don't expect you to know this. So let's look into how that looks. So this is what sine and cosine functions in different frequencies look like. The colors here show us uh, numbers that range from minus one to one. The x-axis show us the length of the word embeddings. In transformers, we are using 512, as I mentioned before. And the y-axis is the position of this token of this word. So if I want to get the positional encoding of a word that is in, let's say, the 20th position, I need to get the horizontal line that corresponds to 20 in the y-axis. And the nice thing about this positional encoding is that it's going to be unique. No other place, no other horizontal line in this graph has the same composition of values as in that line. And one other nice thing about this positional encodings is that you can always tell the difference between two words looking at these positional encodings. It's always going to be the same. One thing that really helped me understand this concept was to look at binary representations of uh, integers. So let's look at these examples. If you realize as you increase your numbers, what happens is the smaller digit in the binary representation changes from one to zero with every new integer. Whereas the second digit changes every two integers. So at first it is zero and zero. And the, in the second uh, two integers, it is one and one. And the third two integers, it is uh, zero and zero again. And again, this pattern kind of follows itself. And what happens is all of these binary representations are unique. No two binary representations are the same. And on top of that, you can always tell the difference between two integers by looking at their binary representations. This could also be a perfectly useful positional encoding for us too, but it is only ones and zeros and we are not actually using the information that can be provided with continuous values. So that's why instead we use sine and cosine functions. Okay, what do we do once we have these encodings, right? Let's say we have this encoding of 512 uh, values that we extracted from this graph. Well, what we do is we basically add them together. We add the word embedding and the positional encoding together, and then we feed it to the encoders. All right, so we learned everything that we need about the architecture. There are encoders, specifically six of them, and there are decoders, again, six of them. We have the uh, last processing in the output. We have the embeddings at the input and also the positional encodings. But how does it all work? So basically, to bring it together, what happens is you first get your inputs, run them through the embeddings, run them through the positional encodings, and then run them through six levels of encoders. And then you get an output. This output is fed to all of the decoders. So we have six decoders, as we mentioned, six layers of decoders. This uh, information from the output from the encoder is fed to all of the decoders. But this information is only fed to the second sublayer, so the multi-headed attention sublayer of decoders. And uh, the first masked multi-headed attention uh, sublayer of decoders get the input from uh, what was outputted from the decoder section of the model in the previous time step. That way the decoders are taking into consideration what was uh, the word in the previous time step on the previous position, and also the context that they learned from the encoding process of the network. To create the output, these decoders all work together and then they create a output vector. This output vector is sent to, through the linear transformation that creates a logits vector. This logits vector is as long as the amount of words that we have in our vocabulary, and it has the uh, possibilities of how likely is the next word going to be one word or the other. And then we pass this through softmax to be able to get the uh, probabilities of each word, and then these probabilities will also add up to one. So basically a normalized version of the logits vector. 
the output of the softmax layer basically tells us what the next word is going to be. And that's all there is to know about transformers really. It's quite simple, even though it looks a bit complicated at first, all you need to know that there are encoders and decoders and the two novel ideas that came into our lives with transformers are the positional encodings and the multi-headed attention layer. To fully understand transformers and how they work, you might need to watch this video multiple times and maybe even support your learning with some of the written resources that are out there. So for that, I've left links to my favorite resources in the description. If there was anything that was not clear or if you have a question, leave a comment and let me know. If you like this video, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and maybe even subscribe to be one of the first people to know when we make a new video. But before you leave, don't forget to grab your free token for AI speech-to-text API. I'll see you in the next video.